Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Today we have my friend, Dr. Sayek Itak, um, presenting his, his research. This year he will be graduating and leaving to go to MD Anderson to do a, um, a molecular fellowship followed by a GI fellowship. So we welcome him this morning and I will let him take over. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, this uh, topic, her 2 del 16 in colorectal carcinoma today. So uh, I'll just talk a little bit about myself uh, before I start into the data and the presentation. So I did my med school from India in Calcutta. And after that, I went to University of Rochester, uh, New York for my PhD. And then I moved to the Mayo Clinic for my postdoctoral studies. And then I matched here. Yeah. And um, my background in research is in organotypic uh, or microphysiological systems, uh, looking at uh, GI carcinogenesis. I've used organotypic organoid and crossover systems. And uh, with the idea of uh, looking into the hallmarks of cancer and the, down, and the uh, background uh, molecular signaling in GI carcinogenesis. So with my interest and background, I kind of moved on to like I'm planning to move on to molecular NGI uh, uh, pathology fellowships. So uh, during my residency, I have uh, been involved in a number of uh, uh, publications thanks to all my mentors. So uh, and uh, my publications have uh, spanned <clears throat> uh, on molecular uh, areas, uh, which I'm going to talk about today. Uh, GYN pathology, this is a study I did with Dr. Khalifa, where we came up with a algorithmic approach of uh, detecting isolated tumor cells in uh, lymph nodes of uh, endometrial adenocarcinoma with MELF pattern, pattern of invasion. And this is a, a recommendation of using A1 and A3 uh, cytochrome stains for detecting IHC, for, uh, ITC. I work with um, Dr. Adi, Dr. Chen, Dr. Bell, uh, to uh, Dr. Lukat to develop a multiple multitude of uh, digital image analysis algorithms for automated uh, ki 67 imaging and others. So this is one of the ki 67 automated imaging that uh, and counting that can be done uh, using a one-click batch algorithm that I developed with Dr. Chen and Dr. Bell. And this is very. This is some hard data back from the oven that came out yesterday. Uh, HCC, uh, cryptogenic HCC in elderly, um, looking at the molecular profiles of uh, the tumors and working with the, in the, in this project with Dr. Aday. Thanks for thanks to him for giving me the opportunity, and we are still working on this. And have also done some fundamental research about the clonal origin of uterine uh, mesenchymal tumors, uh, uterine adenosarcoma, and uh, low-grade uh, endometrial stromal sarcoma to see uh, does they have a common uh, clonal origin or there's a divergent origin and then come through a common pathway in the end. And uh, this was pioneered by Dr. Uh, Khalifa and Dr. Morgan, and then uh, we ended up uh, uh, presenting this data at the ASCAP. And finally, um, my uh, residency was unique in the sense that um, not, uh, nine months into my residency, uh, COVID pandemic started. So there was a lot of improvisation and um, great foresight and um, innovation shown by the AP leadership to go completely virtual and then the virtual sign-offs. And that's when this entire digital pathology and digital slide imaging was this initiative were bolstered. In, in our university, and not only in our university, uh, I'm guessing in lots of other universities uh, in pathology and our digital pathologies is, is, a, is a kind of standard of, standard of uh, service in many institutes, including other, ours. So here we looked at uh, the growing number of COVID uh, cases in our hospital, and also uh, the growing number of, um, the number of uh, cases uh, search path cases that we get every day and number of slides that were getting scanned. And this was a weekly monitoring to know how long can we stay completely digital. And then we went for two months. And then in during the span uh, uh, with the foresight shown by the April leadership, none of the residents, none of the fellows, none of the uh, attendings ever contracted COVID during that platoon system that we came up with. So I thought that was incredible. And 
uh, I would, in my presentation, talk about uh, a molecular case uh, in which we um, uh, there was hard to del 16 variant expression in um, colorectal carcinoma. And I will uh, go into the clinical pre case presentation, and I'll also go to the uh, relevant molecular biology. And I'm trying to explain the um, the reason for resistance to HER2 targeted therapy in this in this patient. And then in the end, we'll discuss the challenges in precision medicine um, that is faced every day by molecular pathologists and oncologists. So uh, the case presentation. Um, uh, it was a 41 year old female uh, presented with a, a 10 centimeter uh, adrytic nasal mass. Um, she has a uh, past medical history of left ovarian mucinous borderline tumor, and ovarian cystectomy was done in 1995. The time of presentation is 2014. Her mother at that time uh, was still living, had rectal cancer at the age of 57. And comorbidity, she had right iliac vein thrombosis detected on CT scan. Um, the ultrasound showed um, this 10.7 centimeter uh, over right ovarian mass that you can see. And this was December 2014. Surgical pathology uh, was done. Um, so she underwent a total ab uh, abdominal hysterectomy with uh, bilateral salpingoferectomy and appendectomy in December. And then uh, the ovary and right, fall right fallopian tube showed uh, metastatic adenocarcinoma with a size of 14.5 centimeter consistent with colorectal primary uh, by looking at the dirty necrosis here and this uh, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma pattern. And the the tumor was strongly positive and diffusely positive for uh, CK20 and uh, CDX2, um, thus indicating a colorectal primary and negative for uh, CK7, WT1, PASIT, and ER. And uh, P53 was also uh, overexpressed. Pelvic washing was also positive for malignancy. So this was January 2015, and um, the Scan, PET scan showed a uh, left pulmonary upper uh, lobe nodule, primary sigmoid colon carcinoma, and uh, left external iliac chain lymph nodes, uh, hypermetabolic signals. Um, at that time, the patient underwent uh, fall fox and avastin therapy from January 2015 to through June 2015. And um, so just a bridge to uh, basic biochemistry or pharmacology. So uh, FU works as um, in incorporating itself in the DNA and thus inducing DNA breaks and DNA damage and thus uh, downstream induction of apoptosis. Uh, the platins, uh, they actually forms an adduct, DNA adduct, and thus induces DNA breaks and DNA jammers and downstream the, uh, apoptosis induction. And then Avastin are, um, is a VEGF inhibitor that um, binds to uh, VEGF receptor and um, basically um, downregulates angiogenesis. She had adverse reaction to uh, oxaliplatin and that was stopped in June. And she underwent palliative sigmatectomy with lymph node dissection in August, 2015. And so, um, Molecular testing was done at the U uh, in the metastatic uh, carcinoma in the ovary um, with NGS Illumina MISIC panel that identified a TP53 uh, PR175H um, um, point mutation. And that corresponded with the dominant negative uh, expression of R that we see in the IHC, the overexpression pattern. Um, the patient was also microsatellite, the tumor was also microsatellite stable uh, with intact MMR proteins and not a candidate for PDL1 um, therapy. And um, while and the, the tumor expressed wild type uh, uh, KRAS, BRAV, HRAS, NRAS, PI3K uh, um, uh, locus. So this is the study that was done at the U. So a little bit uh, on the TP53 um, R175H. Um, so 
This is actually on the DNA binding domain. This uh, uh, residue is on the DNA binding domain of ATP53. And then uh, the mutation actually leads to a decreased DNA binding domain. And if you uh, remember the ATP53 action, so it is a uh, monomer, everything comes together to have a tetrameric uh, configuration and the tetrameric configuration is stabilized by DNA binding. So if there is no DNA binding, the uh, the the homodimers of uh, p53 are not stabilized and thus uh, are degraded and also the other thing is that the the dominant negative effect comes in from here uh, i can uh, i'll go into that later okay so uh, there was an interesting uh, paper that uh, was shared by dr tashakuri in her talk um, which looked at the tp53 alterations and ISC patterns. They went into great details of describing uh, all the ISC patterns that are seen in uh, cervical uh, neoplasia, so uh, squamosal carcinomas and um, in such lesion CINs. Uh, it's a little bit different than the adult carcinoma pattern. There is parabasal overexpression and basal overexpression, but then uh, the idea is kind of uh, similar. They're trying to match the um, um, uh, mutation profile with the uh, ex expression profile. So this is the change that we saw in our uh, case, um, C524G2A uh, uh, transition. And this was also seen in this five uh, cases and all of them showed an overexpression pattern. So corroborating with uh, the dominant negative effect uh, that we're describing here. Um, so, so like as 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 in the middle of describing the dominant negative effect. So the the mutated p53. Not only there is a LOH, there's a lot of heterozygosity. So there is less number of copies uh, of wild p53 being produced. Also, um, the mutant p53 it heterodimerizes with the um, normal p53 and thus sequesters uh, it from the circulation and not let the even wild type bind. And so, and then the body senses that as a lack of P53, it starts overexpressing. So now the overexpression happens from the, the, the damaged locus and the normal locus. And then we have, again, mixed overexpression and then same vicious cycle continues. And that's why the, we have the overexpression pattern. So, and it, it, interestingly, very recently, a lot of papers have come out showing that the mutant P53 also has a gain of function uh, uh, um, change so the that the the, the, mut the mutation also renders uh, the p53 with um, additional effects of driving uh, cell cycles or driving um, uh, growth factor receptors and which are basically promoting the tumor. So this was a significant finding in the in the tumor. And then um, we saw the uh, the, the patient was uh, resistant to oxaliplatin and. Uh, it's always a conjecture that we, uh, we can think about whether that was the reason the patient was uh, actually um, resistant to the chem uh, chemotherapy because with P53 gone, uh, there, there might be some apoptosis res resistance. And all these drugs functions are based on a functional apopt apoptotic system in the cell. So this is the surgical pathology in, Oct in August 2015, the and uh, uh, descending colon palliative resection at this point. Um, it was in invasive, moderately differentiated adenocarcinoma, set as post neoadjuvant. And uh, surgical margins were uninvolved by invasive carcinoma. Um, you can see the amount of necrosis. You can see the uh, uh, lot of mitosis going on. Uh, and it's moderately differentiated. And LVI and perineal invasion was present. And then eight out of 20 lymph nodes were positive for metastatic adenocarcinoma. And that's not a good sign. So therapeutic uh, interventions done. Uh, she was maintained. Uh, so it was June, she was off uh, the oxaliplatin, but October 2015, uh, she was started on maintenance chemotherapy on uh, Zeloda, which is a 5-FU precursor, and then goes down to the same basma and get incorporated in DNA, inducing apoptosis in the end. But she didn't tolerate that. She was, it was changed back to 5-FU five, five in December. And then uh, this is, um, and after that, she was under continuous surveillance. Uh, she showed uh, progression of disease. 
in May uh, 2016, she she had growing node at AOT bifurcation. And then August 2016, she had increased size and numbers of peritoneal mets, lesions around the liver, multiple splenic, new splenic lesions. So she was not responding to anything at this point. Again, uh, falfiri was started. So folinic acid, if you, and I know, TCAN. So iron TCAN is actually a DNA topo isomerase inhibitor. So if you remember uh, the basic uh, bio, mol bio, so uh, DNA replication happens and then it induces positive supercoils and negative supercoils as the uh, replication fork moves. And the DNA topo isomerase comes to nick the uh, a single strand and then release the supercoils so that uh, the DNA configuration can go back to normal and also replication uh, for stalling doesn't happen. So with the um, uh, DNA uh, topo isomers being inhibited by uh, inotecan, there is a blockage of replication fork and then uh, basically uh, DNA replication stops and then uh, this DNA degraded and uh, so on and so forth. Now again, uh, more therapy, uh, no more therapeutic inter intervention uh, was done. So she was back. She was put back on a vestin in December 2016, and October 2016 she showed some partial response through the uh, previous therapy. And uh, at that time, the patient decided December 2016 to uh, go through uh, additional uh, tumor testing at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. Um, so molecular testing at MD Anderson showed or corroborated the TPV23 uh, R175H uh, variant. It showed uh, ERBB2 amplification. It showed APC at exon 16 deletion. So let's discuss the APC exon 16 deletion because the crux of the matter comes uh, uh, is in the ERBB. We'll come to that while we kind of discuss everything else before. So APC uh, exon 16 is uh, this one, so uh, which actually uh, codes for most of the important domains in APC protein. And um, so our mutation, oh, so, we'll, uh, so here you can see the different domains of APC. So these are the um, highly conserved armadillo repeats in the APC uh, family of proteins. And then there comes the beta catenin binding domain. It is the initial binding domain. And then this is the beta catenin down regulation domain, the purple ones. And in between the, there are multiple uh, down regulating domain, as you will see uh, the mechanism of action. And um, it's in, important to have multiple domains. And then we have the accent binding domain. So, um, so basically, uh, this entire uh, thing from beta catenin uh, binding, uh, beta catenin regulation that is coded by uh, the exon 16. Uh, so this is how it happens. So uh, beta catenin is a long uh, like uh, protein with um, all these domains kind of hanging around. So it kind of sweeps through the cytoplasm for existing cyto cytosolic beta catenin. If there is a cytosolic beta catenin, it attaches to the initial beta catenin binding domain. And there are some other partners. This is the beta catenin destruction, destruction complex that we kind of know of in the uh, colorectal carcinoma signaling. So uh, the other partners are axin, uh, GSK3. Uh, so uh, um, once beta catenin is sequestered to this uh, APC beta catenin binding domain, it's like a like six six person basketball match where beta catenin is the ball where it's kind of being shuttled around or thrown around, passed around to you from beta catenin to axin. And then it gets uh, phosphorylated by GSK and goes back to again, beta catenin down regulation domain. Now here there is recruitment of other protein like uh, CK1 um, and, uh, and finally uh, there is recruitment of uh, beta TRCP which actually leads to the phosphorylation and ubiquitination and degradation of beta catenin. So it's a very intricate and in concerted uh, process, interesting process of degradation of beta catenin. So this process is gone when there is a uh, exon 16 deletion. And then this is a known, uh, known thing that happens in 
uh, known driver mutation in a colorectal carcinoma has been characterized uh, very well. And then, so the uh, the uh, under, underlying defect in the uh, DNA is the um, S1411 frame shift. If you remember the um, domain here, it is uh, so around here, this is 1411. So it is again in the uh, uh, exon 16 and then frame shift, there was a frame shift by four and that uh, cause a truncation protein at the uh, exon 16 in this patient. And this particular uh, change has been categorized in number of uh, cancers in ACR uh, project gene, uh, colorectal carcinoma, adden, uh, rectal adenocarcinoma, neuroendocrine, and um, lung adenos. Uh, so all showed, this has been also well characterized. And with that, ERBB2 amplification uh, that was shown in the MD Anderson uh, molecular study. Um, uh, they they uh, enrolled the patient to a HER2 directed uh, therapy trial, which included TRUST2 and Partizumab. And even on the HER2 trial, there was progression of disease in the formation of new and growing uh, node in the right uh, rib. And then the patient was taken off trial. And this was uh, around like, uh, March, April, uh, 2017. And now here is the ERBB2 uh, domains and that are the targeted chemotherapy. You can see it's, it's the locus is in chromosome 17Q, exon 15, exon 16, exon 17, this is the wild type HER2. And then um, the everything upstream to exon 16 um, codes for the extracellular domains uh, and then Exon 70 is the transmembrane domain, and everything downstream is the intercellular kinase domain. And there are autophosphorescent domains here. It's interesting that the exon 16 is a juxta membrane domain. We'll just keep that in mind. So the way it functions, that it down, it uh, hard to signaling uh, goes down uh, to downstream AKT um, and uh, phosphorylations and AKT signaling, and also inhibition of uh, cycling basically uh, P27, P and then which uh, inhibits the cyclin and CDK complexes. So there's a double inhibition uh, or, and, or activation of G, G1 to S um, transition. And then this is the protein domains of HER2. Yeah, you can see, um, so there are four domains, one, two, three, four, and this intercellular kinase domain. One and three are, in, are involved in ligand, ligand binding. And then two is uh, uh, involved in uh, homo or heterodimerization. And four is the juxtamembrane domain, and which is um, involved in phosphorylation, inducing uh, phosphorylation downstream, and also uh, binding site for trust two. And part two binds to the homo dimerization, heterodimerization uh, uh, domain two. And uh, yeah, this is how it, it works basically. <clears throat> okay, so. Uh, so yeah, she she was actually uh, still progressing under uh, targeted uh, therapy, and then uh, she developed recording in progress. She developed brain mets uh, here. You can see periventral ventricular mass here um, in uh, February March uh, 20, 2018, and then um, excision was done, and it, it was consistent with metastatic adenocarcinoma, consistent with uh, colonic primary and. And then at that time, uh, the patient chose to do foundation one molecular thing from the uh, brain map. And it showed that B53R 175 h that was well documented here at the UN, also MD Anderson. Um, APC frame shift, um, that, was, um, that was also seen. I'm hoping that you can, you can see uh, my screen because my video has Anyway, I'll just go on. Um, and then it also showed uh, ERBB2 amplification that was documented in MD Anderson, but also a splice side mutation uh, at 1899 um, position, that is uh, exon uh, 16 of um, HER2. And then uh, that is 
two uh, two positions upstream of the uh, exhaust. So this is, was a key event uh, because uh, just to go into the details of what what does a minus two A to T splice side mutation uh, means and how does it lead to exon skipping? Um, I hope you're still hearing me all right. Yeah, hey, we can, you we can hear you. My recommendation since you've got low bandwidth is turn your camera off so that we don't yes. yeah. really see your face. That'll conserve. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we can hear you very quickly, Sayak. So this uh, foundation one, was it done on the brain or the pre-treatment uh, uh, resection? It was done on the brain, brain tissue. On the brain, okay. So, uh, so this is the, this is the, uh, these are two, exo two exons, um, five prime exon, uh, three prime exon. There is a, there is a intervening intron here. Uh, so, so uh, these are the SNRPs, which are the uh, SN uh, ribonuclear proteins, which are a part of the splicism complex. So U1 and U2 recruits at the five prime uh, intronic site and uh, uh, conserve A site uh, downstream here in the intron. And then this U2AF um, recruits at the three prime intronic site or which is the AG site. So this is the important side that was mutated, and this would render a non-junction uh, of the U2 or non-recruitment uh, of the U2AF. This is an important step because uh, how it happens is that uh, once U1 and U2 is uh, down regulate, uh, are recruited, U1 cleaves at the five, five prime intron and forms a it kind of turns and forms a lariat um, or a hairpin, and then uh, U2 cleaves at the five prime end of the of the intron, and then we have this entire splice zone with uh, other recruitment, and then this five prime and three prime exons are separated, which are uh, fused together. Now you can imagine if uh, the uh, U U two AF uh, splice or, or cleaving is not happening at this downstream exon, um, this U two AF is also being recruited at a down downer like further downstream exon, so exon seventeen, and now this lariat will be cleaved out, including the exon uh, three. And that's how exon uh, skipping happens. And then this is what we have, exon uh, 15, exon 16 is totally skipped, and, and then exon 17 is kind of incorporated in the transcript. In the transcript. And then, uh, so exon 16 uh, deletion um, has been documented uh, biochemically as well as uh, clinically before. <clears throat> And it leads to an active, activated uh, HER2 uh, homodimer. How it happens is that because the exon 16 is a juxta uh, membrane, comp uh, juxta membrane domain, it leads to a conformational change that leads to basically hanging or unpaired uh, disulfide uh, bonds, which kind of tries to uh, stabilize itself by forming a homodimer and activating the, uh, in the process, activating the uh, HER2 uh, itself. And there is the in activation of downstream signaling. So, and then um, this downstream signaling um, involves uh, <clears throat> um, SRC kinase, and then which can be inhibited by dacetinib. And then, so uh, once they figured this out, there was very less uh, to be done, and there was worsening meds, meds uh, for the patient, and ultimately led to the device, demise of the patient in June 2018. So this is summer of the timeline, December 2014, uh, there was a right adnesal mass, uh, uh, total abdomen, abdominal hysterectomy, a bilateral salping oophorectomy was done in December 2014. And it showed uh, uh, metastatic uh, colorectal uh, carcinoma. January 2015, uh, Falfax Avestin was started. Uh, March 2015, UMN and GS testing was done, and it showed uh, the TP53 mutation, the uh, APC, um, uh, the uh, yes, um, these were done, and everything it was everything else was uh, wild type uh, M MSS. August 2015, uh, palliative simulectomy was done. October 2015, uh, maintenance chemotherapy, Zeloda, then uh, 5 afu and disease went on progressing even on chemotherapy. 
um, multiple chemotherapy regimen was uh, tried. January 2017, uh, MD Anderson NGS testing was done and it showed the uh, HER2 amplification and targeted therapy was initiated with, with the MD Anderson clinical trial. Um, there was intracranial METs found in February uh, 2018. And then um, at this point, so it's inspiration was progressing uh, on her two directed therapy. Um, all therapy was, uh, target therapy was stopped, patient was taken off trial, and foundation was testing was done, and which showed the uh, her two exon 16 skipping, or which is called the del 16 variant, along with the amplification. And then the patient uh, uh, passed away in uh, June 2018. So these are the molecular events and comparison of the different platforms that were used for these patients um, and the, at the different institutions. At UMN, uh, March 2015, the uh, tissue was ovary, um, TP53 uh, mutation uh, was done and um, also showed uh, HER2 amplification. And retrospective QC analysis was done uh, to see if the original uh, tumor had the HER2 amplification or the splice side mutation was or not. So it was seen, it was found in the original uh, ovary uh, tissue that was, uh, that, was, that, that was tested here at the, at the U. And then, so uh, MSS and wild everything else was wild type. MD Anderson showed the TB53, HER2 amplification, APC, exon 16, uh, downstream frame shift deletion, um, and then foundation one showed uh, to be 53 uh, RB2 amplification. It showed the splice side mutation and the uh, APC uh, frame shift exon uh, 16 downstream deletion. So the, the, the RB2 amplification as well as the splice side mutation was present in the original tumor. It didn't come out of a uh, selection process because of the multiple chemotherapy regimen that was uh, tried for this patient. Okay, so what do we what do we know about our uh, ERBB2 in collateral adenocarcinoma? Depending on what which source you go to, um, it is amplified to two to eleven percent of CRC, and associated with other mutations as well, uh, TP53, uh, KRAS, BRAF, uh, PI3 kinase, and is an actionable alteration. So here, here comes the uh, idea of, um, so when this ERBB2 is trying, is amplified, there is a lots and lots of copies of the uh, ERBB2 in the DNA. And then the uh, basically replication, uh, transcription, translation, this uh, process, the entire thing, thing is kind of revved up. In this process, the fidelity of the entire thing, uh, like, uh, uh, replication, transcription, translation is not maintained 100%. So there are multiple side mutations that uh, there they occur uh, in this ERBB2 amplified uh, tumors, and one of them is DEL16 uh, variant. And it is, this has been noted in uh, breast carcinoma as well. And it mostly it happens concurrently when there is an ERBB2 amplification, because that's what kind of uh, changes the fidelity of the uh, Slice process, a transcription, translation, etc. So there are multiple studies that have been uh, shown uh, to test whether trastuzumab uh, therapy is beneficial or uh, insensitive or resistant for this ERBB2 del 16 tumor. So this left panel shows mice injected with ERBB2 del 16 tumor cells. Uh, and then trastuzumab and the patient and the mice was uh, given trastuzumab. There was a de decrease in tumor burden. Um, and then, and uh, they say that the ERBB2 del 16 cells also express the wild type HER2, making the tumor sensitive to trastuzumab. And then host immune mechanism come into play. And this is why the mice with the ERBB2 del 16 is uh, sensitive because there is the wild type that is also being expressed. Uh, so this is transgenic mice, transgenic mice uh, injected with ERB del 16 tumor cells. There is, uh, with trust two, there is increased disease-free survival. There is decreased uh, uh, tumor burden, um, and then there is increased SRC kinase activity, 
which kind of goes along with the uh, pathway or, or epistasis, uh, how um, del how del sixteen activates the downstream uh, kinase uh, pathways, and then resistance. They actually show resistance as a late effect, a late event. And now um, this Castiglione group also did a lot of other studies on this HER2 del sixteen. They work mostly on breast tumors. So here, these are cells, um, cell line study in which uh, like 2D culture uh, cell lines transfected with ERBP to DEL16, um, actually, which showed uh, resistance to trastuzumab. Uh, ERBP to uh, DEL16 forms a homodimer constitu constituted the active, acti activating the downstream tyrosine kinase pathway. And it is resistant to trastuzumab uh, and phosphoactivated SRC kinase pathway is downstream activated. And this tumor was uh, sensitive to, and this cell lines, uh, transfected cell lines were sensitive to dacitinib, which is the SRC kinase inhibitor. And on the other hand, this was a very interesting study that was done where uh, the, the cell lines were transfected with ERBP del 16 um, variant. And then uh, trastuzumab uh, was present in the 2D culture system, and they looked at fluorescent trastuzumab binding intensity. So they had a trastuzumab tag with some fluorescence, fluorescent, and, they, uh, and then they saw how much of that is binding to the, uh, these cells, transfector cells. And they did different conditions of beta marker to ethanol. I don't know if you guys remember from basic biochemistry, it's beta BM, BME is actually used in like uh, protein extraction uh, when we're trying to denature uh, the proteins from its tertiary to uh, quaternary to tertiary to secondary structures. So we actually, we, what it does is, is kind of mask or uh, disrupts the disulfide, disulfide bonds of the proteins. And then they, it makes it kind of open up or lose it 3D conformational structure. So when the increasing uh, concentration of BME was added, um, basically, uh, Initially, there was no trust to binding to this uh, to this uh, del sixteen uh, expressing cells. But when BME was added, with increasing concentration of BME, there was increasing trust to binding, showing that at at no BME where, where the conformational changes was there in the del sixteen, actually the trust to uh, binding epitope is masked in this del del sixteen variant, which causes the resistance at least in cell, cell, cell culture model and physiologically, we can uh, conjecture on that. So in summary, um, in this, uh, from the studies that we, uh, that we saw on uh, HER2 del 16 variant, the, uh, there is a deletion of the extracellular uh, domain, formation of a considerably active homodimer, and uh, the cells are sensitive to trastuzumab, or the mice was sensitive to trastuzumab early on. And in mice, there's a whole host immune uh, mechanism. And this thing called this tumor addiction because, uh, uh, or oncogenic addiction, where the tumor is driven by the HER2 uh, amplification. So it has, it has the wild type HER2. Uh, HER2 as well as the trust like del 60 variants. So there was some uh, sensitivity initially with trust, trust to therapy. And then masking of the epitope leads to trust to resistance. And that was the mechanism of the conformational changes that brought about, uh, that the del 16 variant brought about. And then downstream SRC kinase activation was uh, there and which can be targeted by daxatinib. And whether this is a, a choice for this patient or not, we can debate. So back to the case. So would so now the question was: Would TP53 uh, mutation uh, warrant an early target uh, kind of a therapy approach? Uh, because I mean, at least theoretically, all this uh, conventional chemotherapy depends on a functional uh, um, uh, apoptosis mechanism to act. Um, there is not a lot of uh, clinical studies that has gone on to show that okay, there is the there is the this is the actual mechanism of um, conventional chemotherapy resistance uh, with the TP53 loss of function or uh, to, to loss of function mutation. 
but then obviously there is this uh, is a valid theoretical question uh, whether the appropriate uh, machinery needs to be functional for this targeted therapies or not for this non targeted uh, chemotherapies or not and then would that also determine should uh, like should there be extensive testing for a targeted therapy uh, to find a targeted uh, to find a target because uh, the apoptosis apoptosis mechanism is not there so it's better to find a target and then we are talking about uh, 2014 it was still kind of early days uh, of uh, reflex uh, ngs testing and molecular testing uh, and then would identification of our erb del 16 earlier um, would change the treatment plan i mean it would definitely but then um, at that time del 16 there was not a lot of publication that has been there uh, in the in, in the literature uh, on ERB del 16, and it was actually a kind of a evolving um, uh, body of literature. And then the onco uh, the oncology team had to take the decision uh, based on the information they had at the time. And then yes, when they went back and they found the same mutation, they found the uh, del 16. So um, so it was there. But then uh, then uh, since Initially, a focus uh, panel was done, and the uh, clinical team didn't wanted didn't want to know the ERBB2 status or DEL16 status at that time. It just it just that was the standard of care at that time in 2014. So now we know much more, and whether this this should be done first up whenever we saw whenever we see ERB2 amplification or not because of this oncogenic um, addiction uh, concept. It's something that we can debate on. So, would dacetinib be a string bit of choice in if we have identified the del sixteen uh, variant earlier? That is something that we can debate. And then now there is this. Uh, I don't know if you have already talked about it or we will talk about it. I think we will talk about it. So, the, so do we need more retail clinical trials? Which is Actually, this TP53 reactivation, mutant T53 reactivation therapy, there are preclinical pre trials in Europe uh, and European clinical trials, and there are preclinical trials here. And in Europe, there are clinical trials that are going on. These are like small molecules called Prima and Rita, which actually binds to the mutant TP53 and then brings about conformational changes that reactivates the, uh, the tetrameric. DNA binding um, function of the TB53 and stabilizing the TB53. And then the, all those gain of function mutations, uh, the gain of function properties that the TB53 a mutant uh, picks up are kind of lost. And then also this mutant can be sequestered uh, for the ubiquitination and, uh, and deletion. So all these functions can be restored. And then wild type can also go on to do its own function uh, with this Rita and Prima therapy. So there, there are promising um, results on it in, in the European trials. And uh, we know at least more around like 50% of all solid tumors have tp 53s uh, loss of function. This would be, this Rita and Prima would be a very, very beneficial thing for the future if, if the clinical trials hold some good data. And then, um, so this case actually shows uh, the challenges that uh, uh, the molecular oncology and uh, molecular uh, molecular pathology faces every day. How to take a decision that is right for the patient, and it is a dynamic decision. It is like changing every time as we get more information, as we see the response of the current therapy in the patient's disease, and so it's. It's basically it's a very it's a very complex decision, and they for here for this particular case uh, the preclinical and the clinical data was not consistent, so there were uh, there were evidences of trust to resistance uh, in del sixteen variant, also trust to sensitivity to del sixteen variant in the preclinical data, so it was not clear which way to go in actual patients. And there was no patient uh, uh, center study that had been done on her to del 16 on trusted uh, resistance or not. So uh, so the, it was it was a kind of a 
like the it was kind of void situation and the uh, oncology team was working in the void trying to take decision based on preclinical and clinical data which was not consistent and then there was multiple rare uh, genomic um, events that are there there's this uh, hard to there this rb2 amplification which is present in 2 to 11 percent of colorectal carcinoma of which only one percent shows her to del 16 so it's extremely rare event there were other multiple uh, um, alterations that are present p53 was there apc was there so um it was a very difficult decision for the clinical team to kind of juggle everything and also in the real time and try to change therapy as um new data emerge or new or or, or patient uh, treatment response kind of changed uh, during the course of that time so that's that brings me to the end of my presentation uh, i will take questions um but uh, before that i would like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Um, Nelson and Dr. Lou's uh, help and support all the way through this uh, this project and uh, the chance of the publication and um, also kind of uh, giving me a, giving me the full reign to kind of work this up and then write it up. Thank you very much for showing faith in that in, 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 in for, for this project. Um, also I'd like to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, my mentors, Dr. Khalifa, Dr. Adey, Dr. Morgan, uh, specifically um, for from the AP side to constantly help me uh, through my career and through uh, navigate challenges and residency. Um, also, I would like to uh, thank all my co-authors, uh, Dr. Raby, Dr. Chen, Dr. Bell, Dr. Klein, Dr. Dolan, Dr. Stout, Dr. Arif, Dr. Bateman, Dr. Luquet, and Dr. Stewart uh, for uh, for creating a very good rotation, um, like great rotation experience for me in, 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 in during my residency. So with that, uh, I will take questions. Thank you very much. Maybe I can start the video now. Hey, any questions, please? We've got a couple of minutes. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Go ahead, Dr. Adain. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. Yeah, also, Sayak, uh, nice presentation. I think one question I have, especially for the Dell 16, mm -hmm. most of these uh, mutations, they have associated environmental causes. So do you know, or do we know anything about uh, why some people have these uh, mutations? For the, Del from the environmental standpoint. Uh, from the Del 16, particular Del 16 mutation? Yes, for example. Yes, uh, so it has been proposed that the Del 16, uh, Del 16 uh, mutation doesn't appear on its own without the RB2 uh, amplification. So Del 16 uh, uh, variant uh, has all so so far the data that it exists has always coexisted with the uh, RB2 amplification. So now the uh, theory is that, like the hypothesis is that, that whenever there is an RB2 uh, mediated tumor growth or uh, tumor drive, drive which drives the tumor. Um, there is this thing called oncogenic addiction. So all these tumors kind of uh, have this RB2 uh, amplification. And that those are the clones where subsequent uh, passenger mutations would be generated as well, which is subclonal. But then these are the clones which will generate uh, like subsequent mutations. So, and now, like, like we said, uh, like um, we discussed earlier that the in the RB2 Del16, uh, RB2 amplification, there are lots and lots of DNA uh, copies for RB2 and now uh, which are being translated to lots and lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of RNA because we know multiple uh, uh, 
like it, it's kind of a sort of one domain kind of leads to multiple RNAs at the same time. And then multiple RNAs are being processed at the same time by multiple ribosomes creating like multiple proteins at the same time, like, like from the same like RNA piece. So it's kind of a very revved up mechanism and in which sometimes the fidelity of the replication is lost, the fidelity of the splicing and the transcription is lost and the fidelity uh, so this is these are the these were the, these are the points where uh, the fidelity loss can affect in a downstream uh, mutation as well. So so that's where this del sixteen variant comes up. You have this RB two amplification. You have this revved up uh, process of um, RB two protein production in this in this uh, in this cells. But then with, with the loss of fidelity, there are multiple uh, subclonal mutation that, account, that comes up. So, and del 16 is one of that. Uh, if, it, if that answers your question, Dr. Reddy. Yeah, I mean, it does. Thanks. <laughs>